Our scripture passage comes to us from the eighth chapter of the book of Acts, verses 4 through 8 and verses 26 to 40. Listen now to God's word. Now those who were scattered went from place to place proclaiming the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. The crowds with one accord listened eagerly to what was said by Philip, hearing and seeing the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with shrieks came out of many who were possessed and many others who were paralyzed or lame were cured. So there was joy in that city. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up, go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, the queen of Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. So Philip asked, do you understand what you're reading? But he replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? He invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation, for his life was taken away from the earth? So the eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, from, and the eunuch saw him no more. And he, but he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious and loving God, you show up in our lives in surprising ways. Open our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our minds so that we might notice you in our midst and so that we might with joy be compelled to follow you, to serve you, to share your love. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts will be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, to say that Christianity has a complicated past is, well, an understatement. The uncomfortable truth is that most of, his, most of the historical atrocities of the last 2,000 years that humans have afflicted upon others has had a line, whether it be a fine thread or a dotted line or a straight road, to Christianity, or to the Christian religion, shall I say. Crusades, colonization, slavery, the Holocaust, witch hunts, the list goes on. They all find their origin in people who assert that they are exercising their Christian religion 
and enacting God's call. Yet here we are today. Perhaps it is out of stubbornness, or perhaps it's out of hope, or perhaps it is out of a belief that God is love in spite of the way that religion and history have tried to suggest otherwise. Or maybe, like me, it's a combination of all of the above. Perhaps it's by God's grace that we read today a story that tells of a simpler time. A time when the channels of communication between God and humanity seemed crystal clear. A time when the focus of the call to discipleship was to reach across societal divides and to extend a message of love. Now the story that we heard today in the eighth chapter of the book of Acts is often described as the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Now in spite of the radical welcome of this text, we remember that the characters are one person who is named and named again and again and again and again. And the other person is one who is only identified by the labels that are attached to the most marginal facets of their identity. Now let's be clear. This Ethiopian eunuch is in fact a person with wealth, education, prestige, and authority. But their namelessness lets us know that their full personhood is, in spite of these societal credentials, in question by the world around them. Now the named disciple, Philip, has a hotline to God that any of us would gladly pay more for on our cell phone bills. In these 15 verses of our text today, Philip has not just one, but three direct encounters with God. Two communiques through messengers, including the Spirit itself, and one rapid shuttle service to Azotus, courtesy of the Holy Spirit. God directs, and Philip listens, and God's will is done. It's that simple. But Luke, who is the author of the book of Acts, uses a plot device that has been seen throughout all of scripture, those penned in Hebrew and those penned in Greek. He reveals a pattern present in today's story that has offered a consistent message every time it shows up in scripture. Now there is a curious thing that happens every time time. And it's this, that in spite of the world's labels and constraints and even hostility, God lavishes attention and affection on the one who is unnamed. In fact, in spite of repeated use of his name, this story is, an, is not at all about Philip. He is little more than a conduit of God's grace or a superconductor of God's love. Rather, this is a story about a God who knows, pursues, claims, and loves the one whose name is never spoken in our passage today. Now, whether woman or leper or eunuch or Gentile or slave, God's love for those who are unnamed and outside in society is a powerful thread throughout all of scripture. Through prophets and angels and Jesus himself, God sees, hears, calls, welcomes, and claims those not given a second glance in societal circles. God's love is so powerful that God goes to great lengths to show it. And here in our case study for today, God sends a messenger to a messenger with a command to go to find a person who is riding in a chariot in the middle of a dry desert. God opens a dialogue between those who would otherwise never have spoken to one another. And then water appears along a dry desert road so that this outsider might immediately be blessed and anointed with a sign of belonging forgiveness, and love. 
Now we know all too well that things just don't tend to be as simple as this in our day-to-day -day lives. While God's message of love and welcome remain the same, too often in our human interactions, this message gets muddied. There have been way too many preachers since Philip's day who have gotten their signals crossed with God's. Rather than extend God's radical welcome to all of God's people, people of faith of every rank, title, and tradition have played the role of gatekeeper and hatekeeper. They have misused biblical passages to suggest that God's love is for some and not for all. They have mistranslated, misapplied, and picked and chosen phrases that have suited their own personal biases, authorized their own power, and supported their fears rather than opening themselves to the truth of the gospel of love, a message that permeates the entirety of scripture. They have erected obstacles to keep some people out of the community of faith altogether while relegating others to observer status, saying things like, come on, come and see what God is up to. It is a beautiful show, even if it's not for you. Now, I'll confess that my own relationship with Christianity is complicated. In spite of being a pastor for nearly 15 years, I have been devalued, mistreated, and embarrassed by structures, of of by structures of religion that have indoctrinated harm embedded in the church. And I recognize that I say this as one who has layers of privilege, as a white, cis, heterosexual American woman. I have sat with persons of so many ages and stages, whether over a cup of coffee in college or in my office upstairs looking at people in the eye who have tearfully wondered if they would ever really be loved by a God that, had, that they had been told couldn't possibly affirm who they love. I have had conversations with atheists who could point out each trouble caused by the church itself and nodded my head rapidly in agreement, only to answer, I know. But that's the church. God is love. It's hard and it's complicated and it's not easy to hold together. And we are greeted then with questions as those expressed by the Ethiopian eunuch at the end of this text. And it is a question that we hear in circles of the church today. What is to keep me from being baptized, they ask. If God is love, and Jesus is salvation, and the Holy Spirit is strength and wisdom, is this gift not open to me? And Philip answers boldly, and his answer is a word and a witness to all of us. Now he answers not just with words, but rather actions. And as Philip jumps out of that chariot alongside the one who is referred to as an Ethiopian eunuch, Philip says nothing. There is nothing to prevent you from being baptized. You are God's, Peter sa uh, Philip says without hesitation. Eventually Peter does too, but that's a few chapters later. You are God's, he says without hesitation. You are loved. You are forgiven. You belong. You were made by God. You are redeemed by God's grace. This gospel is yours, and you are God's. Come and see and know this truth. Now, see, Philip in this text models to all of us the call to discipleship the enactment of the Great Commission, the life of faith. As a church, whether we're using church in the big C, church universal, or the little C, congregational life, we need to be about the business of removing every obstacle that might get in the way of someone from experiencing the steadfast love and acceptance of God. The message that is ours to proclaim 
is one of mercy and grace and redemptive love. Our message is one that condemns hate and embraces diversity as a proof of God's amazing creativity. The message that is ours to proclaim is that God is loving, redeeming, claiming, and calling everyone. There is no identity, no label, no question, no rank, nothing that can stand in the way of God's love for us in Christ Jesus. Now today we celebrate Full Inclusion Sunday. As Will has shared, we have engaged in this practice for decades as a family of faith. And as a community of faith, we affirm our commitment as a congregation to proclaim a gospel that all persons of all gender identities and sexual orientations are without question created, redeemed, claimed, and called by and wholly loved by God. Today we celebrate the diversity of the body of Christ with thanksgiving for the differences among us and the assertion that we need to be different in order to grow. And so with thanksgiving we extend a welcome to all, especially those who have been excluded from similar settings by others. We affirm our congregational witness for justice, our recognition that our call is not just to proclaim love, but to enact it, and to labor together to ensure that each person receives all of the rights and benefits that affirm their identity, their family, their right to be who they are, their needs, and to affirm that they are who God has made them to be. We offer a counter-narrative to the rhetoric of the church and culture that has insisted that there are only two genders and one way to express love. And we affirm that God, who is love, has a vision for humanity that is far grander than anything we can even imagine. Full Inclusion Sunday is an opportunity an opportunity to give thanks for how far we has, have come as a church and as a society. But it is also a Sunday when we need to be honest and name that our increasingly polarized world and our increasingly polarized church still stands in need of the work of justice that is ours to do. There are obstacles being erected every day that try to stop our siblings. Full Inclusion Sunday is an opportunity to give thanks for the beautiful diversity of our family of faith and of our human family, to joyfully open ourselves to learning from difference and growing together in hope. Now many of you know that I have a child who's in kindergarten. And on the way home from school every Friday, we talk about what their job has been for the week. So he said to me that his favorite job is the job of door holder. He says, Ma, it's easy. And I said, well, tell me, what's so easy about it? He said, all you have to do is stand there and hold the door open so everyone can get through. As a people of faith, my challenge is ch and charge is that we would embrace this call to be door holders and abandon any notion of being gatekeepers. May our words and our deeds extend a warm welcome for all. May we erase every obstacle to belonging. May we profess our commitment to justice and labor together that all will know the love and justice of a loving God. It may be Full Inclusion Sunday today, but the charge, the call, the invitation, the welcome, and the love is for every day. It is not just for here at ELPC where we push these big doors open and say, come on in. 
May this be not just for here, but for everywhere. Friends, you are loved. You are loved. You are loved. Let's hold open doors so that all will know their worth and their love. May it be so. Amen.